so let us start. I'm pleased to introduce Alan Herbert, uh, who is president and founder of Inside Out Bio, uh, and also is an academic supervisor of the International Laboratory of Bioinformatics. And today he will talk about genetic computers. Alan, please. Thank you very much, Maxim, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, as I used, or used to joke about one of my former colleagues who neither knew chemistry or biology well, he used to only talk about chemistry to biologists and biology to chemists. So along these lines, today I will talk about biology. In particular, I will talk about flip-ons, sequences within the genome that can adopt alternative confirmations such as ZDNA, uh, three-stranded structures like G quartets and triple stranded structures. We will connect the structure with function and show how flippons are used to exchange energy for information. So, uh, here's this line out of what the program is today. We'll start talking a little bit about how biologists and engineers view programming problems differently. Uh, we will talk about um, a question from Zebnik. Can a biologist fix a radio? Just to illustrate how differently we think. Uh, this will lead to a discussion of how genetic information is coded. Here we will look at how engineers approach this problem initially very differently from how biology solved the challenge. I will then introduce flip-ons using the example of ZDNA, a left-handed high energy alternative to the Watson and Trick BDNA, and this will lead to a wider discussion of other types of flip-ons on and how they could be used for genetic programming. So this is the famous the Zibnik problem. Can a biologist fix a radio? And so this is just a, a different way biologists go about thinking about things compared to engineers. First, a biologist has to obtain funding. So a biologist will hypothesize that radios are linked to some really important health problems like acquired by oral auditory deficiency or deafness or chronic depression, too much talk radio, or that they cure, cause cancer by inducing people to smoke cigarettes. Then the biologist will start collecting radios and associating certain features and outcomes, like adela colors, drug use, things like that. Then the biologist will dissect the radio into component parts and assign, assign them names, usually descriptive like the most important component, and mutate certain components to see if they break the radio. The biologist might develop high resolution methods to peer inside each component to try and understand the wiring of it, and even start a whole new journal, methods for radio analysis. Of course, it's already all the activity will drive the campaign for more funding to continue this work, collect more radios, mutate more parts, name them. But what the biologist really is lacking is the necessary concepts to understand how the radio works. Whereas an engineer with a voltmeter could probably fix a, a defective part in minutes because the engineering diagram here is, is conceptual. It's not a catalog of parts. So this carries through, you know, uh, how would a, biologists um, deal with a, with a magnet. You know, one of the first things a biologist might want to do is to dissect out a magnetic monopole. And he just probably just start with a scalpel because that's his tool of choice. Uh, the biologist probably would like this experiment with polarized filters because the answer is very black and white. But then again, the biologist would be very confused if you put another filter between the two. It's a confusing result, uh, not intuitively clear why it works. Uh, it was even confusing for the great Einstein. It took Bell to show that this simple approach enables an experimental test that disproves the notion of spooky action and resistance in quantum mechanics. This is how the Bell experiment works. So I'm no Bell or Einstein, but if I'm sure if you apply the third field correctly in a biological system, you can see the letter Z. Uh, this slide is just to make you aware of an upcoming conference on ZDNA, flip ones that Maria Popsova is helping organize that focuses on this mysterious left-handed confirmation. Hopefully the Z confirmation will be less mysterious after this talk. Many of the latest um, findings on flip ones and ZDNA and ZNR, ZRNA will be, be presented to the meeting. So it's um, called the ABZ meeting. So register at abz2021.bio and it's free. And we have some great speakers there. 
Um, I kind of mentioned how biologists approach these problems. How would an engineer um, encode a biological organism? So we have some examples when we go back to the origins of the genetic code. You know, we have Gamoth, who first came out with the idea that uh, amino acids were templated by DNA, but then when it was shown that proteins were encoded in the cytoplasm and DNA was in the nucleus, that fell apart. So then he came up with an overlapping code, but that was um, not correct either. Other physicists tried to come up with a binary code that DNA could be used for. You could, it's made of purines or pyrimidines. One could be a zero, the other one could be a one, or maybe there's some modification on the DNA at six amino or six keto group that could also serve the same function. But that's not how it worked. Uh, finally, the simple cipher that the genetic code is was elucidated. And what it actually depends upon is just a small RNA adapter that translates uh, the nu nucleotide sequence into an amino acid protein sequence. And it's kind of interesting because it's uh, a very, it uses very generic protein machinery on either side. So there's very generic machinery to transcribe um, DNA into RNA, and there's very generic machinery on the other side to translate RNA into protein. And so the genetic code actually just depends on a very small RNA adapter that allows mapping of one system onto the other system. Um, so this adapter allows for a very precise description of proteins. It's actually not a code, it's a cipher. It maps nucleotide triplets to amino acids. It's very complex, it has high information content and the message that encodes the protein. It's very specific. It defines exactly what the protein activities are. And it's very constrained because it's difficult to vary. You put a mutation into the sequence somewhere along the way, you end up with um, a less fit organism, less able to survive. And so it relies a lot on redundancy for robustness. And sort of according to the this kind of thought, of this being the uh, key to what biological organisms are, it was expected that when we decoded the human genome, we would have 100,000 genes because we're so much more complicated and sophisticated than other organisms. But that actually didn't turn out to be the case. We actually have fewer, organ fewer genes than, than many other organisms. And so what instead we have is we have a different way of reading out our genome. We actually have a virtual genome. The readout is matched to the environment in which we measure that genome, how it functions. The genome is soft-wired rather than hard-wired, allowing it to be read out in many different ways. The ability promotes survival by ensuring sufficient phenotypic diversity at every level of organization so that you end up um, being able to survive a lot of different situations. So we have a gene type here, but that maps to lots of different ribotypes, which map to lots of different phenotypes, depending on how the readout is accomplished. So it's just not simply a, cipher that gives us the abilities to run organisms. So along the way, um, there's been a lot of surprises here. You, you know, initially it was just the idea of DNA to, goes to RNA, goes to protein, but now we know that it's not one way that we can go from RNA back into DNA. We can find out that DNA can be reprogrammed um, by rearranging the base pairs, especially in the immune system to create more diversity. We also found out that DNA that doesn't code for protein is actually not junk. It actually serves a lots of very important function. We found out that RNA uh, can also regulate DNA readout, also can regulate protein translation, and also can be catalytic. And so it's not really just proteins that are the cellular machinery that makes us run. We also found out that DNA is not the only source of heritable variation. There are things called prions, for example, with, that are transmissible and affect the phenotype of offspring. And what we're now finding out too is that it's not just the DNA sequence that's important in, in encoding genetic information, but also the DNA structure itself. So there are a lot of surprises here, and it's not exactly the way an engineer would encode an organism. There's no top level precision that maps all the way down the phenotype. And it's something that evolves in a way that um, most engineer systems cannot. So let's give you some examples of uh, how this actually works in practice. Those are high level concepts, but um, one of the big surprises that was that genes are actually in pieces. So you don't actually always encode 
a protein by a single readout of information from the a genomic locus. In fact, often you have to read out different parts and then assemble them into a functional protein. Uh, this process is called splicing and so it enables you to make different proteins from the same genomic sequence and allows uh, different domains to be spliced in or out so you can change the protein function um, by either including a domain that encodes an enzymatic function or excluding it. And here's kind of just an, an image of how the RNA maps to the DNA where you have all these black loops of DNA sequence excluded from the final RNA message. So a lot of the genome is just there, but not necessarily read out under any particular set of circumstances. So um, you don't even need um, sex chromosomes to actually develop organisms with different sex sexes. You can do that completely just with the same set of DNA. Uh, for example, with American crocodiles, uh, you can do that by changing the temperatures. You can have females, hot or cold, or males uh, just made one way. Uh, this is also true in Australian lizards where it actually depends on the temperature of the mother that changes what, what the sex of the offspring is. And also in Drosophila, for example, it just depends on how an RNA message is spliced. There is just no Y chromosome. So this is a, just a, an example of the different ways that nature can actually generate the sexes without actually encoding them in the DNA itself. So there's also another example here of where you can use RNA to program. And again, this uses generic machinery to affect the outcome. So in this case uh, of microRNAs, you start with a genetically encoded double-stranded RNA. You use some generic protein machinery to produce a single-stranded RNA. And that single-stranded RNA matches sequences that you want to regulate. And these sequences, for example, these processes are used to regulate uh, translation of RNA and also to destroy RNAs that uh, you may not want to be expressed. An example of that is um, used in the pinworm where the expression of this green RNA into, into this red protein uh, occurs at a much later time in the development of the organism. And depending on what that gap is, you can change what the final organism looks like. And what's enables finally the um, expression of this protein is this microRNA that suppresses this protein, LIN41, which originally suppresses the expression, the translation of the LIN29 RNA. So you have an RNA that's produced, its expression is expressed by this protein, and then this protein is then suppressed by a microRNA using a matching sequence. Uh, that then allow, allows this LIN29 protein to be produced. So it's called heterotronic development, but it's it's just an example of how you can vary organisms without changing DNA sequence, but just changing the timing of expression of RNAs using generic machinery to, produce, to regulate how those RNAs and how that genetic information is expressed. But even weirder than that, you can actually find genomes that don't code for anything. So DNA is not always supreme. For example, in trypanosomes, which cause sleeping sickness in their mitochondria, if you sequence their uh, genomic DNA, their maxi circles, they're full of stop coding codons. They don't actually encode any sensible protein. To get a sensible protein out of them, you have to take the transcripts from the maxi circles and then process them uh, with RNAs from a set of other DNA elements called mini circles. And um, these mini circles are highly variable, so you can, depending on the organism and depending on the mini circles, you can extract lots of different proteins from the same defective genomic DNA. And so this process is actually um, one that involves uh, editing of the RNA that's spread out from the genome. So in this particular case, you can either add uridines or subtract uridines to put everything back into the correct reading frame. And this, again, is uh, guided by RNA, by these guide RNAs. And again, it uses generic machinery. So uh, in this particular example, uh, you have this template that acts, that by, this guide RNA template that binds to the genomic RNA, and that then allows, uh, followed by a cut, and then this is used to template uh, insertion of bases 
whereas the reverse happens here where there's a, a bulge in the genomic RNA that doesn't match the guide RNA. And so that particular sequence is deleted in the final message. And the interesting thing is that you can do this sequentially. So you can work your way down and process the RNA in a number of steps until you get one that produces proteins. So um, just in case you guys are curious, uh, this is the kinetoplast here in the trypanosomes. And when you look on, under in high resolution, you see all these mini circles um, that are contained in that particular organism. So that's one form of uh, RNA editing that is guided by RNA, that's insertion and deletion editing. But there's another form of uh, guided editing in, of genomic messages that's called substitution editing, where instead of deleting or inserting bases, you actually modify the base that is at a particular position. And in this case, this is an example of adenosine to inosine editing where you have a hydrolytic attack on this amino group, which results in the substitution of the sketer group. And the significance of that is that the sketer group is then translated as guanosine. So you actually go from an A to a G, so you change the, the sense of the, the message at that particular position. So again, this occurs in a double standard RNA, and the edited adenosine gets popped out. And once the this, the other strand is just acting as a guide to get the generic machinery in place to do this particular editing. And so um, this is basically uh, how it most often happens where you have a single RNA that has the sequence to be edited plus a complementary sequence that will base pair with it. And that complementary sequence will then uh, specify which of these A's are edited and and exchange. So you can get editing on both strands and you can change um, the A to an I, which is translated as G. So this is kind of an example where you form a double stranded RNA using a guide sequence and that these sequences here really can be varied quite widely um, to change what's carried through in the message. So when this, pro and this is the kind of editing that we're going to be talking about in the subsequent slides, it's the editing, that, the editing that occurs in humans and mice and Drosophila and many metazoa. So um, it's to break this down just a little further, just to hammer the point, what we have here is we have a, a, a generic structural motive, motif that is created by having a guide RNA that has specificity that identifies the sequence to form the generic structural motif, then we have structure-specific binding proteins, uh, which we'll be talking about today. And then uh, with the, many of these structure-specific binding proteins have low complexity patches on them. Um, they normally, uh, translational modifications, you can put a phosphate there, you can put sugars there, and you can um, put patches there that have high affinity or high affinity for other proteins. And those patches allow you to assemble the functional machinery. So here you have um, high specificity from the RNA, but all the rest is pretty generic, where you can have um, the structural proteins, you can have a patch that allows you to assemble the machinery that you need. And this patch can be quite variable, and it's something that you can change on a protein uh, without necessarily affecting any of the, the coding properties of the protein. So you can reuse uh, many of these same very specific proteins again and again uh, just by varying the patch or by varying the, the guide sequence that I use to it, nucleate the assembly of the machinery. So this process is highly combinatorial so you can mix uh, some um, specific structural protein with some specific functional domain in the combinatorial way just by changing how you make that patch. And so in contrast to um, the genetic code and evolution driven by trying to vary protein properties by mutating the genetic code, this is a much faster way to evolve where you start with things that you know what they do, and then you uh, use RNAs, which can explore a, a very large sequence space to guide their function or to guide what they act upon. And then you can um, 
end up trying lots of combinations and variations uh, to develop phenotypes that the environment can then test and select. So it's a different way of looking at evolution rather than looking at mutation of the genetic code. You're looking at combinatorial effects using different structures and, and proven functional domains to do different things. And so uh, when we talk about structural motives here, we've, so far we've only talked about double-stranded RNA as being a structural motive that's used, but you can also encode lots of other things in the genome that are structural motifs for which you can have structural specific proteins. And you, because they're genetically encoded, you can vary where in the genome they occur and, and when they occur, and you can use them to actually guide biological processes to help um, develop phenotypic diversity. So these structures that here are the left-handed structure that we will talk about today. There's also the possibility to form three-stranded structures. Um, there's four-stranded structures as well that you can fold from a, from a single sequence. Uh, you can also fold a, a similar, uh, a, sim, a four-stranded structure from the complement of, of this sequence. You can also have elements that are architectural, that like they bend the DNA and restrict um, what happens to the DNA either side of the bend in terms of its topology. And compared to that, Watson and Crick DNA is pretty boring, if you ask me. So there's lots of things that we can do uh, with structures in DNA and in RNA that can guide biological processes that can generate phenotypic diversity. So these motifs are structurally encoded. Uh, they are based on low complexity sequences uh, that are very frequent in the genome. So to form these structures, you actually need to have a, very often have a repeated sequence, which are the majority of the genome. Uh, these are called clip-ons. Um, they are any sequence that can adopt an, an alternative conformation under physiological conditions. Uh, they require energy to flip conformation, and that depends upon the context. Um, it's determined by the particular sequence that they repeat. It's also determined by modifications of the basis that happen. So you can lower the energy by using certain modifications to the, the basis themselves that favor one conformation over the other conformation. And it's also the energy is provided by local topology. So the process of transcribing RNA or separating um, DNA apart uses energy and that energy affects the local topology that can then affect the uh, formation of these, these flip-ons or the flip of these flip-ons to the alternative structures. So the biggest thing about them, as I was emphasizing previously, is they, where they form allows localization of specific machinery to the, those parts of the genome so that you can actually take a, a machine that you know already what it does, and then you can localize it to a particular part of the genome to perform a specific function. And so by varying where flip-ons occur in the genome, you can change where that machinery gets localized to. So from a programming point of view, you can kind of think of the flip-on where is um, intermediate between the genomic source code and between the codon where that encodes specific proteins that eventually the wetware turns, turns into outputs. So um, the flip-ons kind of are more like a compiler they represent an instructive code on how to extract the information from the genome. And then the codons themselves are more a cipher to translate um, the, whatever is produced for, through the action of flip on where into amino acids to proteins to outputs. So this is kind of the, the thing that we're kind of working on at the moment in terms of thinking about what happens with um, ZDNA, which is what we're going to be talking about now. So ZDNA is actually the first example of a flip-on, series of flip-ons in biology, where we have structural proof, we have biochemical pathways, and we have genetic proof of uh, its action. So it's a, this form of instructive coding using flip-ons is now not only theoretical, but we actually have evidence for it. So it's quite a, a big advance has happened over the, the last few years. So I'll talk about the discovery of ZDNA 
and then subsequently ZRNA, its structure about Z binding proteins, about the genetics, about the function, and about how they enable binary computing in biological systems. So we are getting back to the Gamow uh, idea of having a binary, binary encoding in DNA, but it's not um, through bases, it's through structures. So ZDNA is left-handed, and you can tell it's left-handed because it kind of the backbone points to the left, where it is here and what's in trick DNA. It's right-handed, the, the arrows, the, ba the, the backbone points to the right. It's uh, slightly longer than VDNA. This is like a 10.5 base repeat. This is like a 12 base pair repeat. This is like 45 angstroms, and this is like 34 angstroms. So it's um, thinner, longer, and twisted the other way. It was first spotted way back in 1972 when using circular diachronism, you could actually show that there were, and you took a long polymer of alternating poly DC you could actually change its optical properties so that it flipped from a right-handed structure uh, with the spectrum inverting to what appeared to be a left-handed structure. But it really wasn't as more of a curiosity because to do this, you needed 3.5 molar salt, which is not really very physiological. Uh, I think what was exciting was the fact that you could actually show that if you stress DNA, if you niggle the supercool DNA, then you could actually stabilize um, ZDNA under physiological conditions. And so this experiment here is just done with closed circular DNA. And this is um, just showing you with closed circular DNA, you can wrap it around each other to, to have rive. Um, and then if you actually untwist one segment the reverse way, you can absorb some of this rive um, so you, you decrease the ride, but then you accommodate that by forming a left-handed sequence while all the rest is right-handed structure. And you can actually visualize this on a gel. You can see, see with a control plasmid, you can talk them up so that they have um, lots of negative supercoiling. But when you flip to Z in this particular plasmid, suddenly you lose a lot of that ride. And then um, you, again, begin accumulating it. So it's actually kind of a, a neat way of visualizing the flip from right to left, where you just change the properties of the top topo isomers. And so as I mentioned, this requires energy um, to flip. In this case, the energy of negative supercoiling will allow you to flip from right-handed to left-handed. You can also do it with base modifications. And it um, shows a lot of kurtosis in the flipping. It's regulated biologically by topo isomerases and by polymerases and by helicases. And it occurs favorably in certain sequences, like an alternating CG sequence is more favorable than an alternating CA. It um, has informational basis, the value that was realized right from the start because these repeat sequences are not randomly distributed through the genome, but they occur at um, five prime enhancer regions and, and three prime UTRs and all that kind of stuff. So they, they, they actually have, um, although they are repeat sequences, they are not randomly distributed through the genome. And they can be modified by all these different processes. Um, so, you know, it's something that nature can control in terms of where they, they form and where they, when they don't form and it can prevent them from forming and it can and make it easier for them to form. So this was way back in 1979 when the structure came out. And so um, it was kind of really interesting. Everyone was really excited. The DNA moved to real biology and at that stage I was in New Zealand. And so I played to come to MIT to work on this. And then by the time I got to MIT, uh, the tides had turn the people becoming really skeptical about whether there's any function or not and I got there and it only got worse um, as we went along. Um, what was the only good thing about it is that all the people who were skeptical about it having a biological function, they were having as hard a time getting their skepticism published as we were in getting our experimental findings published. So as you can see the citation index uh, decreased in all these skeptical publications and finally it was like almost a death knell in the sense that the historians were coming out and saying, well, so history shows that there's no ZDNA and nature is not opportunistic. So 
it wasn't um, it wasn't an easy ride getting to the point where we are now, but it's it's nice to be able to tell the story. So uh, eventually, you know, part of the problem was the Z uh, ZDNA structure was very high energy and very hard to trap and very hard to find uh, proteins that bound to it. And we didn't exactly know what we were looking for, whether we we're looking for something that was sequence specific or structure specific. We were just looking for anything. So eventually, uh, after we set up some some assays that were pretty much black and white, just like the polarized filter kind of experiment, uh, we did isolate something that uh, seemed to be inhibited by supercooled plasmas that had Z-forming elements, but not when those plasmas were relaxed. We got a single protein out. We showed that protein bound to um, ZDNA probes, and we showed that when we isolated the domain that we could do this flip, this optical flip, where we went from right-handed DNA to left-handed DNA. Then, but still, people were very skeptical about that. So we got a structure out there uh, about 1.9 angstrom, which is pretty hard to argue with, and it confirmed most of the biochemistry. So there's no doubt that there was a Z DNA binding protein. And subsequent work showed that this uh, protein also binds Z DNA, Z RNA, and actually the Z DNA Z RNA hybrid. So um, in terms of the structural, the structure and the um, bike physics, we were in good shape, but then there were always questions about the biology. So what was kind of interesting, we showed that the protein was really high affinity, so it has a small affinity for ZDNA, um, more biophysics. Uh, we also showed that this protein itself, um, RIP was the first of a class of proteins, uh, which included some viral proteins. This is from Vaccinia protein, and uh, this is another protein called that was called ZDNA binding protein one uh, that we'll talk about later, but it's also part of this family. So we did find this domain. We did find that um, it was representative of a family of proteins, but we still didn't really know what the biological function was. One clue we got was that the function was actually associated with the uh, adenosine to adenosine editing, that, editing, the substitution editing that I, I described, and it itself was tacked onto another family of proteins that were all um, deaminases of one sort or another, starting with a tRNA deaminase. And so as we worked up the evolutionary scale, we finally got the, the Z alpha domain that bound ZDNA tacked onto this whole thing. And so, you know, the question was, well, does ZDNA regulate RNA editing? And this, as I mentioned to you before, that RNA editing depends on the double stranded RNA substrate, so we have a generic RNA substrate, and we have something like Z-alpha, which I, 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 sorry, I didn't mention to you, is structure specific. You know, there was no, there's no sequence specificity in this binding to ZDNA. It's, it's purely structure specific. So we have two structure specific domains along with these double stranded RNA binding domains uh, in this protein that's uh, changing, doing base substitution. So you know, the question was, does that give some insight into the ZDNA biology. So the initial um, thought was that because you could change adenosine to adenosine, which is translated as guanosine, that this was just going to be a way of recoding RNAs to get more functional proteins out of what was encoded in the genome. And so you know, the potential for changing um, from one amino acid to another amino acid in the prote protein is pretty profound. These are all the examples of where you can make that substitution. In this case, uh, you can um, end up going from one amino acid to, to two amino acids here. You can take out stop codons. So, you know, it's kind of um, a lot of potential for recoding. And so a lot of people just focused on that and thought maybe the ZDNA domain was irrelevant in this protein. But what became very definitive was this particular set of mouse experiments here. So what's shown here, uh, a normal mouse and a mouse with some genetic mutations made in them. And in particular, there's a genetic mutation that um, inactivates the DNA domain. So these pro this protein is not capable of editing any RNA. The deaminase domain is inactive. And yet this, this guy here survives. So it completely eliminated um, any important function for codon editing in terms of this enzyme. 
the question is, well, um, why does this mouse survive? Uh, because if you knock out the whole ADAR enzyme, so you take out everything here, uh, the mice die as embryos, but this guy not capable of editing, um, but with this ADAR1 protein being ex expressed survives. So how, how does that happen? And it turns out that the only reason that these mice survive is because of the second mutation that you need to make in this protein here. And this protein here, um, it's called MDA5, it's encoded by this gene IFI H1, uh, is actually senses double-stranded RNA. So if you have double-stranded RNA around, this protein gets activated, then uh, causes immune activation, in particular interferon activation, which then goes on um, to cause developmental defects and cause a uh, cause of embryonic death in these mice. So it turns out that although codon editing is not important, that editing of double-stranded RNA by this protein is really important. And it's the, re the activation of the interferon pathway by soft RNAs. And so other experiments also showed that uh, you could get rid of the P110, the shorter isoform that doesn't have the Z binding domain, and, and mice would still die. Uh, you could get rid of this and mice would live, but if you got rid of the P150, mice would die. So this whole experiment was the first validation that the P150 protein with the Z alpha binding domain uh, was essential for survival and had an essential function that was different from the shorter isoform that lacked this domain. So uh, it so happened that there also is a human disease um, or a series of human diseases that are called type 1 interferon neuropathies where you get inappropriate production of interferon and um, these are associated with mutations in this enzyme ADAR that has the Z-alpha domain in it. And so um, these can vary in severity of onset. They can cause your um, brain to die uh, at a very early stage, or at later stages, they can appear as chronic interferon activation and inflammation in various systems and, and less pronounced cases, they, uh, you, you can live to old age, but you have other uh, inflammation related injuries. So the question was, um, could we use this to actually provide genetic evidence of um, a role for the Z-alpha domain in biology? And so it turns out that uh, because of all the structural studies that we did, we knew exactly which mutations or which messages were involved in the ZDNA binding, and we they were in the Z-alpha domain. And it just turned out that there were human uh, variants of these residues that were associated with disease. So the variants of these um, residues were associated with the failure to turn off type 1 interferon responses. And there really was the first proof that there was a biological function uh, for Z-alpha in regulating interferon responses. and by logic that this involved um, the Z confirmation. So this is just an example of how that genetic experiment works, um, where basically there are three variants in the Z alpha domain. There's the wild type variant, there's a variant uh, in which we have these mutations, and then there's an, a, a variant which just takes this whole P150 message out, but still allows the P110 to be produced. So in all these uh, different genotypes that you can get from these variants, the P110 is still wild type, but the uh, mutations are just affect, affecting the P150. So um, with, and since you have two alleles, one from your mother, one from your father, you can get combinations of these, these different alleles to produce the different genotypes. So in this loss of function mutation, um, it's actually quite frequent in um, Northern Europeans. Uh, like 4.4 percent, which for a, a Mendelian type variant is, is quite high, and the the idea is that there's been some selection in these populations, probably possibly by a virus, possibly during the Middle Ages when all the urbanization was going, that there was a selective advantage to producing more interferon than um, others to be able to survive those those infections. 
There are also um, other variants as well, uh, where if you had just one allele that produced the P150, you were pretty much okay. You had a very mild disease, but you know if you actually had a lot of function compared with an, a null allele, then you, you got these different type one interferon diseases. And in this particular case, you could map the um, loss of function variant directly to the disease because it was like just having one effective copy of the allele and the null allele was gone. So any variation in this had to be causal for disease. And so that's kind of how that was done. And then you can do like biological experiments. You can show that if you have one of these variants, uh, you get the presence of this interferon regulatory protein in those variants, but normally these these um, that protein is suppressed by wild type. So you know, we kind of a, have a lot of biological stories. So the question is, what is the double stranded RNA that's edited? And it turns out it mostly is in terms of repeat elements. Uh, these elements, uh, something I'll describe in a moment, but th these uh, edits that occur just about in every tissue, and they also uh, a few that are a tissue specific, but most of, of them are generic and occur in lots of different elements. They actually um, tend to be in protein coding genes. You know, if you look at the whole genome, the red here is a protein coding gene versus all the information that's in, in intergenic spaces. And then if you look at protein coding genes themselves, you find that it's mostly not in the coding region, but actually in the intronic region in between the stuff that is spliced out. So these LRO repeats about 11% of the genome. Uh, they're named because of an enzyme that cuts within them. And so they were found early on as repetitive sequence of uh, 170 to 120 base pairs once you cut them. These LRO elements do not encode protein. All they do is copy and paste themselves into active genes. They're just replicating themselves with no other purpose in, in life. They've invaded the human genome a number of times. So there are a lot of different allele family members uh, reflecting each wave of invasion. And at one stage they are uh, threatened to take out the human genome because they insert into active genes. And so we're very disruptive. But now um, it's as evolution works, what was once the invader is now co-opted to protect the host. And I'll explain that very quickly now. So this is uh, what an allele element looks like. Um, it started off life as a single alum, a single half, but that was duplicated to give a dimer. And this dimer folds up into this kind of structure. And it has these A and B boxes where, which are necessary for it to be turned from DNA into RNA. And it also has a Z box that's involved in the, the RNA editing. And so um, the A box involved in transcription and the Z box actually started off from the same sequence, but the Z box now has evolved to be an alternating curing perimeter sequence, which is uh, favored to form Z DNA and Z RNA compared to the A box, which has uh, evolved slightly differently. So um, normally these allo elements by themselves aren't very good editing substrates. They normally are bound by lots of different proteins. Um, so normally to get an editing at substrate out of them, you need two allo elements, and these element, allo elements fold back on each other to give the double-stranded substrate. And when you get that double-stranded substrate, you get all these edits around here, and you get the Z-box folding up in the center to help localize the P150 enzyme. So um, this Z-box that's here uh, is adjacent to the site that um, the double-stranded RNA binding domain is like to bind, so you can bind both at once, and it's highly conserved among the LO families. So if you look at all the edits that occur in each of these LO families, you know, there's millions of sequences that go into, into making this diagram. You see that the Z-box uh, is really highly conserved in all these different families, and um, the question is why, and the, the answer is that it's useful for the host. So we know that the Z box actually does form Z RNA. Uh, we can score the sequences um, using the physical chemical estimates of energies to form Z DNA. And we can show that these LO repeat sequences uh, are Z forming. We can take out those sequences and uh, study them by NMR and show that in the presence of the Z alpha binding domains, they actually form Z RNA. And we can also show that um, many of these Z-forming sequences um, 
don't actually involve canonical base pairs like you normally expect G to pair with C, but G pairing with U is okay. And actually having these non-canonical base pairs actually favors um, Z formation then the, the affinity constant again is nanomolar. So it's um, a good Z RNA forming element that binds the Z alpha protein and it's good for localizing the enzyme ADA to those particular sequences so they can do editing. So um, a quick recap of what I just said. I said a lot, but um, basically it's a simple story. The double-stranded RNA uh, normally activates double-stranded uh, this MDA5, which goes to interferon response. The Z formation um, stops this from happening in a way that I will describe and will localize the ADA1. The ADA1 then edits the double-stranded RNA and prevents MDA5 activation. And um, we're not going to go into it as well, but um, this Z alpha domain from the P150 also competes with the, the other Z binding protein one. And this Z binding protein one, if Z is formed in an unrestrained fashion, will activate self death pathways called necroptosis. So the question is um, does this all work because this, this helicase promotes Z RNA formation? And so let me tell you about, about the helicase a little bit more. The helicase you can see by electron microscopy actually assembles on double stranded RNA and forms these filaments. And so these filaments keep forming and forming and forming in a process of fashion. And it involves um, binding of ATP as the energy source there. So uh, you can actually take these structures, these, these filaments, and then reconstruct structures that incorporate them and you can show that when they bind ATP they're in this conformation and when they um, have hydrolyzed ATP to give ADP they're in a different conformation and when you actually look at the double stranded RNA in these particular helices you find that um, when MDA5 binds it actually shortens the helix so if you count down forwarding bases in the ATP helix and then match it to the forwarding bases in the ADP helix you can actually see this helix here is much shorter. So what happens is the MDA5 binds to that double stranded RNA and twists it and shortens it. And so that seems to be what's driving the Z formation in these Z boxes. So what is happening is that you get the twisting, they get the shortening, you get this being stretched and that flips it into Z RNA, which binds the P150 which then acts to break up the double stranded RNA so you don't get interferon activation. And you might ask, why should this cause Z formation? And the question, the answer is really simple. It's um, the Z helix is 45.6 angstroms compared to the A helix. So when you, when you flip the Z, you relieve the strain that's caused by the twisting and shortening induced by MDA5. So it's just like a, a flip switch where suddenly um, you go from A to relieve the tension, you flip to Z and then you localize your P150 enzyme there to do all the things it needs to do. So it's a twist going to Z formation, going to the release of the MDA5 with hydrolysis of ATP and then the binding of a, a P150. So the, you know, the outcome of this is that the um, MDA filaments do not form in the host transcripts because the host transcripts have lots of allo repeat in them in the double stranded RNA. So you, you have all these little circuit breakers that stop the MDA, MDA filaments from forming. And so you have a space where you can have um, allo amylance forming ZDNA that's reversible, which stops the MDA5 assembly, which stops the immune activation. Whereas uh, in other situations with viral elements that form ZDNA, often that's irreversible and that, that activates the ZBP binding protein one and leads to cell death. So you have a nice little space that you can operate a genome in while protecting yourself against uh, viral infection. So this is not the only way to form ZRNA. You can form ZRNA by having a helicase that persists with this other end fixed again what happens is it induces unwinding of the right-handed RNA behind it, uh, which then is relieved by flipping to ZDNA, which is left-handed. 
And then you can also do it topologically where you can take two single stranded circles that are complementary and when they pair together, um, one half has to go to A RNA and the other half has to go to Z RNA because you, you need to uh, relieve the topological strain and you do it by making one half left-handed, one hand half right-handed. And so um, you can see ex evidence for this kind of thing happening uh, inside cells. You can get RNA tangles where you have topologically isolated domains that where you get enough stress to induce Z RNA. And so here you can, it's probably you can't see, but here you can see that in the cytoplasm where you get these RNA tangles forming, you get localization of the Z alpha domain and these little dots. Whereas if you only use the P110 protein, which doesn't have Z alpha, you don't get these tangles forming at all. And they're called stress channels. And we know they're called stress channels because they have a characteristic protein that goes there. So you, you can see that the uh, in the stress granules that are characterized by RNA tangles, there's enough topological strain there to produce uh, Z RNA. Uh, also viruses um, have a challenge because they need to assemble their genomes into packages to be able to, to transmit themselves. Uh, with flu, you have 11 different segments that have to uh, glue onto each other to make sure that the right number gets into the virion. And to do, and with HIV, you also need to form a dimer. And so even though these are single-stranded genomes, they need to form double-stranded RNA to make sure everything is assembled. And, you know, in that particular instance, you know, we have to back actually be able to form the double stranded RNA, they actually have Z-forming sequences on either side of the, the stem. And so you know, during this whole process, it seems like Z RNA formation is an intermediate in the packaging process. So this particular requirement makes them vulnerable to um, activating ZBP1 and cell death. And so you can actually see this in, in, in the influencer infection that you get Z RNA formation inside the nucleus and that's, uh, what's associated with activation of ZPP1 and cell death there. So viruses know that they have this problem. So this is why many of them have um, related families, uh, family related proteins that are Z alpha equivalents that can compete with these Z dependent processes. So, you know, again, that's biological evidence that this confirmation is, is something that um, evolution has used in a spy versus spy, host versus um, virus kind of scenario to try and uh, evolve ways to survive the host on one hand, the virus on the other hand. So um, what I'm trying to kind of convey here then is that there is biological evidence for these things. You know, the question is, what do they do? Uh, and what else do they do? And so, you know, you can think of the flip on as a, as a binary switch. You know, you can switch something on or switch something off, you know, in terms of being the firm responsible of switching that off. Um, so, you know, you can go back, to, for example, to the splicing example where we have um, Z formation being made behind a polymerase where the energy is coming from the polymerase and Z alpha is binding to that. And then any double stranded RNA that's formed from alloys or other sequences are engaged by um, the editing machinery. And so you can turn this into a very simple logic gate, for example. So if you um, are using that to control splice, oops, yeah. So if you're using this to control splicing, you can use this to control whether a kill tag is in the message or not. So you can get a message that has a kill tag or a message without a kill tag. And so the one with the kill tag in it gets crashed and the one that um, lacks the kill tag is produced. So, you know, it's a, definitely a very simple on-off system. And you can see this with the splicing as well um, in an, another context where, again, you have the editing of this double stranded RNA by ADA, which enables exon 2 to actually get connected to exon, this exon, exon 1 and exon 2 to connect with each other. And so you get this splicing isoform, but if you lack um, P150, and this is experimentally shown, if you take out P150, rather than having um, a linear RNA that's produced, you can have a circular RNA that's produced where the, the uh, splice is between exon 2 and exon 3, producing the um, circular RNA, which is very stable, which can um, bind up lots of RNA binding proteins, and uh, it can 
act as the regulatory switch in a cell. So depending on whether you want to make linear RNA to make protein or whether you want to make a circular RNA, which is stable and can regulate um, the availability of many RNA binding proteins, you can do that. Again, this is kind of a, um, a more complicated binary switch. Uh, you can also um, have Z-forming elements in the same topological domain. So you have two Z-forming elements, um, one with the, a great Z-forming sequence, CG8, one with a very long Z-forming se sequence. And you can create a topological switch here so that um, initially when you start negatively supercalling this, what you find experimentally is that the, the best Z-forming sequence goes to Z. So that's where your Z formation is. But as you start increasing the topological uh, stress within that domain, uh, the second longer element absorbs most of the topological energy. And so it goes to Z and flips the other sequence back to Z. So you can actually flip where you want Z forming in that particular uh, topological domain. And again, this is easy to evolve. It just involves inserting se sequences, um, repetitive sequences into a genomic se sequence. It doesn't require any fancy engineering. It's just something that you can test and if it creates a successful phenotype then, uh, or a successful form of regulation, then it gets collected. So we're just coming again, just as our examples of how you can use flip-ons to change readout of codons and the outputs in the system. Uh, all these other flip-ons form under different conditions. They have different sequences. Uh, they, um, the G flip-ons are much more stable. They're not reversible. They don't this have the same hysteresis as ZDNA. Uh, the I flip-ons are pH dependent, so they will form under different conditions. These architectural proteins as well uh, also can be inserted in different parts of the genome and it can actually be used to isolate topological domains so that you can concentrate all your, your negative supercoiling in one particular region of the genome. So there's lots of potential there for um, using these elements to change how RNAs are actually produced from by genomic readout. So you can compile them much differently depending on the state of these different flip-on conformations. So um, these repeats do make up the bulk of the genome. So there's lots of potential there. Uh, they are very evolutionary efficient because they keep reusing the same structure specific motors again and again, um, but in different contexts. And they produce phenotypic variation. Uh, this is just an example of where you can use these different flip-ons um, formed by with the energy coming from RNA polymerase to control um, depending on the sequence whether you get a G quadruplex or a R loop or triplex or something like that. You know, they're easier to form and they each can have their own particular consequences. For example, the G flip-ons are stable so they can be act as memory elements, and there's evidence that they are actively involved in DNA repair and also gene regulation. They, you can set them so that when you divide cells, that their settings are carried through from one cell to the daughter cells so that you know how to start reassembling the um, chromosomal structure to get the right gene expression in the daughter cell. You know, the, trip, the triplex is kind of a fascinating structure because it's not so much the triptychs formation that's important, but the fact that you can attach to that triptychs forming sequence, um, an RNA containing lots of different motifs. And these motifs can be assembled combinatorially so that you, again, you can use a, a fairly generic motif with some generic machinery and then recombine them in different ways to assemble different cell machineries, again, without evolving the proteins involved at all it's much easier to vary RNA sequence than it is to vary protein sequence. So there's a lot of potential for combinatorial diversity here. And coming back to what you, your, your department's more interested in, in, you know, can we use these practically? Can we put flip-ons on silicons? So you have a G-cortex, for example, is something that you can control the folding with small molecules. So it can be act as a memory element. You know, the, um, it's possible to use um, Z formation to al allow energy transfer from um, one fluorescent residue to another one. So this acts as a switch. Here you don't get any energy transfer, so you would get green and reds 
you, you just, you would get no rich signal if you stimulated the green, but here, if you stimulated the green, you get transfer and you, you could tell it's in Z. So that's one way of measuring lots of different physiological conditions, you know, salt conditions or temperature conditions. You know, it's a very sensitive sensor potentially. Again, you can also regulate um, Z formation by mechanical stress as with the example of MDA5. And so it's very, it becomes a very, um, if you tie down one end and then you pull up on the magnet on the other end, you can flip the Z. And again, you can use the fluorescent dye reporters to tell you, give you a readout. So it becomes a very sensitive uh, force detector if you want to do that. The other interesting thing you can do is play around with nanopores. Uh, you know, you, you put finger molecules through a nanopore and you can fold and unfold confirmations to change how these molecules move through the nanopores or whether they um, um, are susceptible to different enzymatic functions. And you can use them like a Turing tape, you know, for doing lots of combinational um, diversity. You can, they're massively parallel and they allow you to, um, rather than having to do everything in bulk, you can do steps sequentially. So if you want to do a combinatorial problem, <coughs> you can um, do each combination at a single time, and then you can read out what that sequence is in the nanopore, and then you can uh, either continue that combination or else you can restart the tape to uh, start looking for an acceptable combination. So there's lots of things that, uh, can be done using the flip-ons to control how this tape is changed during the process. So um, the future, well, we've given some examples of how we're starting to understand the biology of flip-ons. You know, we don't really know actually how to apply all this knowledge yet, but as science shows us, as history shows us, there will be some really important applications that come out of this in terms of targeted therapeutics and cell engineering. The field is quite wide open. So we're at the stage of having built um, an understanding of what the flip-on alphabet is, but we don't know how to combine that alphabet into words for the tuning of topological circles, circuits, for evolvable resistors, capacitors, amplifiers, you know, basically try and do something with this concept that's equivalent to this concept where we can actually um, do biologically engineering, not based on a parts catalog, but based on function. So thank you very much for attention. I think we're probably a little long on time, but I'm really happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Alan, very much. So we have some time for questions. Uh, please, if you have a question, write it to chat Q&A or you can uh, raise hand and then I will give you permission to speak. So meanwhile, may I ask you one question? So one of the last slides you have shown uh, ZDNA formation to measure force, this kind of experiment. Yes. Uh, uh, and is it like a theoretical experiment or can it actually be implemented? Like, is it a real life experiment? You no, know, it's, it's a real life experiment. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Zeb Bryan uh, in Stanford has done a lot of that. And um, I think this slide here was um, an experiment that was done uh, in the Lee, Lee lab, by Lee in Korea. So, you know, it's, it's real. All exactly. these are real. This is real, this is real. Yeah, all this is real. Oh. Oh. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, are there more questions?